Are you bored living a mediocre life? We were too, and we know how to change that. Each week, we'll leave our comfort zones to explore a new topic, then step onto our soapboxes, a safe space to sound off on our latest adventure. Come explore with us. All opinions are welcome. This is a mindset. This is a lifestyle. This is Siren Soapbox. Hello and welcome, fellow explorers. Thank you for diving in with us today. Our mission is to explore beyond comfort zones. Let us inspire you to explore. Visit sirensoapbox.com. We have a link for a free month of Audible, information on upcoming challenges, a link to our coloring book, and information on our new magazine, Explore Out Now. Join us, guaranteed to spark some exploration. We are... In episode 80, and I don't think you're ready, because it's another LC mystery episode. (laughs) All that the sirens were told was the challenge in the soapbox. Their challenge was to uh, take some dive phrases that make them giggle, that land lovers won't understand, and try to use some dive slang in your everyday life for a week. Their soapbox is going to be report back if any worked and how it was to introduce phrases common to you in an uncommon setting. Our soapbox order is going to be Murr, Sarah, Jess, and TC. But first, if at any time the conversation gets too intense, the safe word is... Mango. Mango. First up on our soapbox is Murr. So like LC said, our challenge was to try to use dive phrases in ordinary conversation. And I found this super difficult. First of all, there really aren't very many dive phrases that I could think of. And how in the world am I supposed to work in dive phrases with people who are staying above the surface? I was speaking to a new vendor at work last week, explaining the third party due diligence review process. And I managed to sneak in a, before we dive too deep, let's talk about Bibbidi Bob. And there was an occasion where I wanted to throw up the safety signal to warn someone at work. She had been talking to me for too long, (laughs) (laughs) but then I would have had to explain to her what it meant. And that would have definitely prolonged that conversation. So all in all, I feel like I failed pretty freaking miserably at this challenge. Maybe I just didn't get creative enough with it. But since our challenge was to use die phrases out of context, I'm going to guess that this week's show is about metaphors. Maybe we'll discuss uh, meanings, both literal and implied metaphors. That's my guess. Sarah, were you able to work die phrases into your conversations? Well, a little bit, but I really wasn't sure how to approach this. Um, the obviously funny and slightly naughty phrases that I wanted to use were pretty much out for me, seeing as I was only at work or at home all week. I'm not exactly Miss Politically Correct at work, but I do have to keep my job. So uh, getting wet, diet, diving, going down, you know, all those typical (laughs) things. So, you know, you know what I'm talking about. But I did have a little fun with surface interval though. We had a patient that required two anesthetics in the same day. And I was asked if that would be okay. Normally I'd have explained about how it's really not an issue at all that there are no adverse consequences and so on. This week I had much more fun though. I just said, as long as we made sure the patient had an appropriate surface interval, all would be fine. I have to tell you, I got some strange looks. These guys have known me a long time though. So while they don't expect normal from me, I did surprise them with that one. One of the CRNAs that was listening to the conversation is a scuba diver though, and she busted out laughing. So then I had to explain what was so funny. Now I realize this next one isn't a phrase, but it's a scuba diving signal. It's one I adopted a long time ago when my friend and I were getting all of our certifications. When I would check on the CRNAs in my rooms, I started giving the okay sign instead of a thumbs up because you know, I was just that cool. Some of our CRNAs are scuba divers, so they got it right away. And the rest just respond with the okay sign when I give it because clearly I'm that cool. And I've done (laughs) everything. So with this challenge, I decided to up the ante a little. Instead of an okay sign, I started giving the surface okay signal. Boy, did I get some looks from everyone in the room. What was really funny though, was some folks just gave it right back. (laughs) Asked them why, some of them knew what it meant and some admitted that they 
had no idea, but clearly I wanted something in return. So they just copied me. I guess I should try something really crazy next time. As to what this mystery episode is, I have no idea. Um, LC just surprises me every single time. Jess, what do you think? Well, I find that I use dive hand signals in my everyday life, especially like okay sign, just because I don't know, thumbs up to me in my head, like you're not supposed to do that because you don't want to go up, you want to stay down. But I find that I use it like if the waitress comes up and my mouth is full because they always seem to come up when my mouth is full. So I do that and they get what it means. But I do use dive phrases a lot when I talk to Ben, but I'm usually talking about diving or an experience I had when diving. And he knows what a lot of them mean because we've been married for 16 years. And a lot of that time I've been a diver. My first step was uh, to try to integrate dive phrase at a meeting at work. I told them that I needed a safety stop. <laughs> I in even included the hand signal. I got some weird looks, um, but they seemed to know what I meant and asked if we wanted to take a break. So I said, yes. Um, later on, I used a service interval when I was talking to my team that weekend and they asked what I was going to be doing for the long weekend. I told them that my service interval interval had been too long since I've been working on the house and they asked if that had something to do with going into the ocean and I said yes that diving they know I'm a scuba diver so I think that helped but it's interesting because here in Hawaii a lot of times when you're talking about diving a lot of people think you're talking about free driving because a lot of people here free dive in spearfish so that's usually what they think of. And uh, I mean, to me, that's, that's not diving. I mean, it's still cool because you're still getting in the water, but it's not the same. But I found it super hard to integrate phrases because so many of them actually apply to while you're diving. And, uh, you know, also like Sarah, I could not use the dirty ones while I was at work. <laughs> but I don't have any idea what today's episode is about, but I'm hoping that we get to spend like the next hour talking about diving wow. because I'm glad to talk about diving. So TC, how did it go for you? When Elsie suggested this challenge, it sounded easy and fun. It really wasn't that easy. It is surprisingly difficult to work in scuba lingo when you are not diving. Some phrases to use. When someone is acting crazy, are you narked? Divers know this word as a short term for nitrogen narcosis or the drunk euphoric feeling you get when you dive too deep. The rest of the world associates narc with someone who tells on someone for using drugs. So that didn't go over well. Let's go down. For divers, this is an exciting phrase because it means we're ready to descend and begin the dive. It's exciting for the rest of the world too, but for a completely different reason. <laughs> Safety stop. When diving, this is when you hover at a 20 foot depth to let your body off gas a bit before you reach the surface at the end of a dive. This was the easiest phrase to incorporate into everyday life. It's easy to say when something gets heated and uncomfortable and everyone just needs to cool off. And most people can tell what you mean when you say, I need a safety stop. Where are the turtles? In either scenario, it means that I haven't seen turtles in a while and I want to see them. It's always appropriate. The answer I'm most often given in Tortai Town. Diver, diver, are you okay? This is something you say before you give someone CPR or try to rescue them. It would seem strangely inappropriate to say this during a land-based emergency. Maybe this is how I'll wake Dino next time he falls asleep. I'll let you know how that goes. A lot of dive phrases are done with hand gestures. We've made up some of our own. Whale shark, parrot fish, and sea cucumber are some that come to mind immediately. You'll have to watch on YouTube if you want to see what those look like. Side note, having a dive buddy with whom you communicate well underwater is a great joy. Lucky me. Overall, I was woefully unsuccessful on this goal. Most of my friends are divers and they know each of these phrases. At work, it's just another example of me acting different. I can't wait to see what Elsie has in store for us in this episode. Maybe something about how people feel when they don't know the language, or maybe something about having inside jokes or stories, either being a part of them or not being a part of them. Should I be ready to go down 
or calling for a safety stop. We'll see. Elsie, what exactly do you have in store for us tonight? <laughs> well, before we get there, uh, I came up with a list of dive terms and you guys kind of covered some of them. The go down, surface interval, safety stop. Safety and sausage. Yes. I was really hoping somebody would work in a safety sausage or a mask squeeze or even an FFM, a full face mask. Because those terms, hey, somebody, was it TC hit on that? Those Narc. terms are way different <laughs> on land, a farmer John or even to pee your suit. Wait, what's a farmer John? It's the, a wetsuit without sleeves. Oh. Like a tank top. An, an overshorty. Wetsuit. Yeah. So, we have any final guesses? Yeah, I like uh, TC's guess about um, not fitting in. I, Mark and I were talking about this earlier. I thought maybe it could be something, have something to do with inclusion. Yeah, have you ever? I mean, one of the things they talk about <clears throat> when you're building a team and trying to get people to feel cohesive is by creating little inside stories or inside lingo that other people don't know. So that would definitely make you feel like an outsider if you don't know the inside lingo. Or an experience like I had where you can get people to do some really strange things. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I mean, That's everybody amazing. in the room's just, okay, Sarah, whatever. <laughs> did you know you had that kind of power? I, I, I guess I do. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, drum roll, please. <laughs> Today we are talking about idioms. An idiom is a phrase, saying, or a group of words with a metaphorical, not literal, meaning, which has become accepted in common usage. An idiom's symbolic sense is quite different from the literal meaning or definition of the word of which it's made. There are a large number of idioms, and they are used very commonly in all languages. There are estimated to be at least 25,000 idiomatic expressions in the English language. Idioms evolve the language. They are the building blocks of a language and civilization. They also have great intensity to make a language exciting and dynamic. Idiomatic expressions bring a spectacular illustration to everyday speech and provide compelling insights into the use of words, language, and their speaker's thought process. Idioms have a sense of mystery and fun about them. So what makes them difficult? The answer is their meanings. Idioms are not easy to understand, especially for a non-native speaker, because their intentions are usually symbolic. This characteristic makes them strange and difficult to understand for English learners. This, all that information came from www.theidioms.com. The idioms claims to be the internet's largest idiom dictionary. It was very helpful in putting this entire podcast together, not sponsored, and all that information is going to be um, from here on out from the Idiom website. So do you want to play a game? Yes. <laughs> You're hey, gonna wait. Be I, yeah. I just want to say that I, I really am not good with phrases, and I'm, I don't feel like I'm going to do well on this. Well. I think you're wrong. I think that when I worked with you closely, I know we work together closely now, but you know, in a previous life and we worked together in um, an educational technology setting and IT setting, you used metaphors all the time. Oh, well, I'm good at coming up with metaphors, but I'm not good at sayings. Like one time I said to somebody that someone was talking on horses and they're like, what? are you talking about? I'm like, isn't that a saying talking on horses? And they're like, it's really not. What do you mean by it? I'm like, <laughs> like they're really important and they know all the things. And she's like, oh, you mean they're on their high horse? I'm like, what does that even mean on their high horse? <laughs> oh my gosh. My brother combines two idioms together all the time. Like he's like, that's the pot calling the horse black or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. This is going to be so much fun. I can't wait. Yeah, so me too. TC, would you say that you're outside your comfort zone on this? I am outside my comfort zone. You all yes. are going to realize just how much I don't know phrases. See, I thought you'd be really excited because this is all about language. I am super excited and I love language. And when phrases come up, 
I love to look them up and then we change them. So after the game is over, I'll give you an example of a phrase that Dino and I use that is the flip of a, a real phrase. Ooh, I can't wait to hear it. All right. So you guys are going to be shown an idiom and its meaning. And then we're going to guess in rotating soapbox order. So that means like Mer, since you went first for soapboxes, we'll have uh, Sarah go first. <laughs> Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> <Her face. laughs> I love it. Okay. And then we'll rotate through like that. Uh, guessing the idiom's origin. Closest guess wins each round and the most correct guesses gets to pick the challenge of the week for our listeners. Oh, good. So if I lose, I don't have to worry about a challenge that since I didn't bother to come up with one because of <laughs> exactly. the uh, mystery episode. Got it. Um, right. Unless you win, then you're, you're in the same boat, <laughs> right. okay. which I guess, I guess that could be an idiom right there too. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i suppose i could spoiler <laughs> alert spoiler hey, wait, you yeah. didn't you didn't say this but i'm sure that no googling is allowed right duh okay. <laughs> although <laughs> you were showing us your setup beforehand and we would never I know. Even know. <laughs> <laughs> I know we're gonna but, know she's gonna be like this considering the fact you told us you're horrible at it <laughs> <laughs> Well, but here's what the ones that I hear, I do look up. I love to know like phrase and word origins. So maybe we'll see. All right. So our spoiler alert for those of you listening and you want to play along like the sirens are playing along, go ahead and head on over to Siren Soapbox's YouTube channel starting Monday, June 6, 2022. There you'll see the slideshow as we're viewing it right now. So if you're listening via podcast and you want to play along with with the video, but you really need your Siren Soapbox fix, you'll have to check out one of our other 79 recordings until you're able to watch the show. Might I suggest begin with yes, queen of your own life, fast burn, Viking funeral, or creative cure. Actually, they're all my favorite. Any of them are going to inspire exploration. So check out any of those other ones and hit us up over at YouTube if you really want to watch on the YouTubes. So the the YouTubes, the YouTubes on the interwebs. So to get us warmed up, we're going to look at some easier idioms. I'm sure you guys have all heard about. Can you guess what any of these originated from? Oh, are we going in soapbox order? Yeah, it just, this can be free part. Oh, okay. So this is just free conversation. Yeah. Um, at, At the home is an actual saying. Yeah. It it just means that you're you're the one steering the boat, right? Like that's the origin, no? Yeah, but like tonight I'm at the helm for this episode. I gotcha. But so the it's origin the is this is why I'm not good at sayings because I take it literally. <laughs> so in this example, Elsie, what what's the origin? So at the helm is just a maritime origin. It means mm, you're gotcha. the one at, at the steering wheel, basically. So a close shave then, like its origin feels like it comes from a barber shop. Yep. And, you know, if it's a close shave, you're cutting it pretty close. You're in the danger zone there, buddy. See, close shave, that's a saying that people use? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. What about by by the the bullet? Did you know about that? Um. Did you know that was a saying? I know what it, I know, like, bite the bullet, I know what it means. Biting the bullet means just going ahead and doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Bite the bullet, just go ahead and do it. But where it comes from? I feel like it comes from the wild, wild west. I feel like it comes from when the doctor was going to do something to you in the olden days that hurt, so they gave you a bullet to bite down on. Yeah, I think it was the Civil War era. They give you, a, like, if they have to do something out in the field and you have to literally bite the bullet and get your surgery taken care of. See, I'm going to be good at the origins because I take everything literally. (laughs) You're like Drax from Guardians (laughs) of the Galaxy. (laughs) Why would I put his finger across his throat? (laughs) I mean, break break a leg. I've heard people, I don't know the exact origins. I've heard that's because you want to be part of the cast. That's why you say break a leg. Fan the flames literally adding oxygen to the flame to make the fire worse you're making the situation worse 
What about hit the sack? Go to bed, man. Yeah. I guess beds so, used to be made out of sacks. Yeah, they yeah, were like ago. sacks filled with hay or whatever. And you would have to beat them, right? To make sure that there were no rodents mm-hmm. or whatever in there yeah. or make it fluffier or something. Yeah, you got to get this fucking mice out of there, man. Yeah. yeah. I've, you don't I've been mice. watching alone. <laughs> you don't want mice. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about armed to the teeth? Yeah, I don't know what that one means. I think it means like you're pretty well protected, but I don't know. Like you have enough ammunition, you've got it piled all the way up to here. Yeah, I thought it just meant like you're really prepared, not necessarily by guns and ammo, but just like super prepared, like you might have done all your research for an episode. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's what it means. But the origin, I believe it's from like pirate days and they have so much guns and knives and stuff on them. They have nowhere else to put it except like putting a knife in their teeth or a gun in their teeth. You are armed to the teeth. Like it is everywhere on you. What about bottom of the hour? Yeah, I I mean at the half hour. Yeah. Yeah. Is it like, um, what do you call that? um, That hourglass? Yeah. Is it like the hourglass? It's the last pieces of sand going down the hourglass maybe? Uh, Well, the bottom. That's a good way to think of it too. I think you went too far back though. I think Sarah had it right with the half hour. Mm. Half hour is the bottom of the hour. Because you're oh, looking at the six. clock. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. See, I always thought the bottom of the hour meant like the last bit of yeah. it. Like the last Me too. 10 like, minutes or something. Like 350. Yeah, that's yeah. what I thought too. Okay. But it literally is the bottom of the hour would be the last half hour. It's the bottom half. Yeah. Hmm. What about fly off the handle? I know that means to like be angry about something. So when people like cutting with an ax and it would fly off the handle. Oh, that's bad news. Yeah, that's bad news. That's that's bad news. Bad news. So bad. This one's a little bit harder. I didn't know this one going in. Close, but no cigar. (laughs) I know that it means you're really the daddy. (laughs) <laughs> yeah that's i know that means that you didn't quite make it but i don't know where it comes from i want to say you, cuba because that's where i know cigar good cigars come from <laughs> it must have to do with celebrate you celebrate with cigars you were close but we're not celebrating because you didn't quite make it you're not really you're not the father of this, this kid you don't get the cigar <laughs> is that that really days on maury <laughs> yeah or jerry springer definitely maury cigar yeah. Uh, so in the 1800s at fairs, if you were playing a game and you didn't win, it was close, but no cigar. They gave away cigars as the prizes. <laughs> so I don't know if they were giving those away to kids or not. <laughs> yeah, that's what possible. I'm thinking, like, <laughs> I mean, everyone was encouraged to smoke back then, probably. Yeah. So you guys feel warmed up? Yeah. I'm all warmed up. All right. Well, here's our first idiom. Rabbit hole. Oh, gosh. Of course. (laughs) Obviously, I had to do this one first because we use this idiom all the time here at Siren Soapbox. And because the next idiom, my husband and I went down a idiom rabbit hole coming up with a list of all the ones we could possibly think of up the top of our head, which he helped me with tonight's episode. And tonight is his birthday. It's May 30th. Happy birthday, honey. You're now older than me again. (laughs) Happy birthday, Jack. (laughs) Happy birthday, Jackie. So, rabbit hole. Meaning, mentally, to go somewhere surreal or strange, enter a chaotic or problematic situation, sucked into a weird situation. Sarah, you get to guess first. What do you think it means? Well, I guess... Or the origin. The origin, I guess, because... A rabbit warren is such a windy, twisty um, thing. I've got so once you get into a rabbit hole, it just goes on and on forever and has so many twists and turns and pathways and different things. You can just get completely lost and go in so many different directions. But I mean, I don't know where, I mean, how much further can I go into figuring out where the origin is? Do we all guess or just the person who's turning this? No, nope, we can all guess. Jess, you want to guess? Oh. I'm guessing it comes from um, days of, of hunting when 
like you know when people started hunting with like dogs and stuff and they would send their dog into the rabbit hole and maybe they didn't know what was in there could be rabbits could be a snake could be nothing that that was my guess too back they they used different terriers small terriers to hunt little animals so i was guessing when your small dog went down into a rabbit hole to try to pull back out the rabbit i'm guessing if it's not that then it is from you know obviously alice in wonderland they must have coined this phrase down the rabbit hole i thought that at first that's too, where wonderland I, is i thought that was that too but then i thought well that probably came from that phrase well it probably did but it's a fun story which came first the rabbit or the hole <laughs> oh it is from oh, alice in wonderland yes, yes! One, this phrase came about in 1865 in Lewis Carroll's story of Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Alice actually falls down a rabbit hole in the story and ends up in Wonderland. Wonderland, if you've ever read the book or seen the films, is a strange and surreal place that a lot of people believe was based on a hallucinogenic experience. Mother's little helper. (laughs) You got it. Eat this, drink this. Oh yeah, that's right. So the next one is rule of thumb. And this is the idiom that brought about the whole idea for the show. I said something was a rule of thumb for, I forget what now. And Jack told me a surprising origin and I didn't believe it. So we had to look it up. And then that got us down a rabbit hole of other idioms. (laughs) So rule of thumb means a principle that is kept to um, practical and approximate way a guide that is based in a practice rather than a theory. So who's got our next guest? We got Jess going yes. first. Yes. Yeah. Uh, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm guessing it's, I don't really, I have no idea. All right. T-P. I don't even really understand the meaning. Like, <laughs> I'm going to guess that it has something to do with measuring things but i don't know what or when but it it i'm wondering if it has to do have you ever seen people like close their eye and put the thumb out so i'm gonna guess it has to do with some sort of measurement using your thumb literally all right mer um yeah i kind of agree with tc but i don't know why i feel like my i feel like like a surveyor might have come up with that, like a land surveyor. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm going to, I don't know on this one and pass it off to Sarah. Maybe, right. it had, maybe it has something to do with the sun or something if you could block out the sun with your thumb or something if you could, because it has to have gone back quite some time, I would think. Like if you could do something with your thumb and the sun, you could tell something. Probably, yeah, like navigation or something. That is a really good guess. And you can use your hand to measure like the sunset and things like that. But I'm going to give the point to TC. She's our closest. And this one comes with a trigger warning. This phrase has been used since the 1600s. And the origin is usually attributed to domestic violence. However, there is no proof of this theory. There was a belief that there was a law in England that allowed a man to beat his wife with a stick, which was not thicker than his thumb. However, it has been found that such a law did not exist and the phrase has been used before the law and it is believed that nobody really knows where this origin comes from. So, but that's the popular theory. Then how did TC get closest? She didn't talk about beating anyone. Well, because she talked about measuring. Oh, okay. All right. I'll let you have it. I'll agree. With, I'll agree on the ruling. <laughs> don't take my sure. points away, hater. But <laughs> Mer, you didn't want to win because then you yeah. don't have to pick the challenge. Also, replay, you said, I'm going to go with I don't know on this one. That's true. <laughs> oh, I'm not saying I should have won the point. I was just right. maybe arguing that TC shouldn't have either. <laughs> well, she has the closest because she's measuring with a thumb. That's true. I feel, okay. I feel I get the it. love. I feel the love, Mer. Thanks. <laughs> All right, our next idiom is bury head in the sand. It means to hide from the truth, to play dumb, to avert shame, to act stupid. 
And next up, we have TC going first. All right, I'm going to guess that this is from an ostrich who literally buries their head in the sand because um, ostriches are big, kind of gangly, awkward birds. And yeah, that's what I'm going to guess it's from. Mer? Um, I was trying to think of an animal that buried its head in the sand and Tracy stole that thunder from me. So Not another idiom. I know, <laughs> another idiom. So I think that um, my other guess would be a turtle because turtles like to go into the sand. But I guess they mostly just go into their shells. I guess they only dig holes in sand to lay eggs. Oh, yeah. Sara. You think of an ostrich burying its head in the sand, but then why would we have decided that that meant that they were hiding from the truth? Do we think that they're dumb? Ostriches are dumb? Yeah, I don't think ostriches fly. Don't people see them as big, dumb, gangly birds because they don't fly? That's, that's where I think it comes from. Maybe. I mean, I tend to agree. I think you just maybe, you may have hit the nail on the head on this one. (laughs) 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 I kill me. Yes. I was also thinking an ostrich actually, because I, I don't remember I want to say it was a Dirty Jobs episode where they actually went to an ostrich farm and they talked about ostriches burying their head in the sand and they did it like when they were scared or trying to hide from something. So like like uh, a toddler. I, I can't see you. You can't see me. Yeah. Yeah. Like I do. I actually do that with my cats. When I take them to the vet, I cover their faces and it seems to make them not fight as much like basically just pretending it's not happening. If I can't see it, it's not happening. So I'm going with an ostrich. It also works with gators. <laughs> um, I don't know who to give the point to. Probably TC since she said it first. If it's an ostrich. Well, you all agreed. So maybe it just cancels each other out. Being one of the older verified origins, this one dates back to the early Roman Empire around uh, 30 to 50 AD. It was recorded by Philony the Elder. He was an author and naturalist who spent most of his time traveling, studying, and writing about the natural world. It was his mistaken inference that ostriches would hide their head in the bushes to avoid the danger, and it became a common misconception that we know today. So this has been going on for like 2,000 years. Thanks a lot. Philony. I don't even know if I pronounced his name right. I want to take a stab at that. Plinius. Pliny. Plinius. Plinius. Yeah, I think it's Plinius. So what they're actually doing is they're checking on their eggs because they bury their eggs in the sand. And if there's danger, they go and look for their babies. Oh, oh. that's sweet. So it's All like right. the opposite of ignoring and. Yeah. It's like very caring, actually. I feel like we should stand up for all those ostriches. Yeah, I'm going to start saying, oh, way to bury your head in the sand when somebody does really good things. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to flip the script. That's another idiom, probably. That could be a good challenge for our listeners. (laughs) Flip the script. (laughs) All right, our next idiom. Don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Don't be ungrateful when you receive a gift. Don't be critical of a gift you receive. And we got... Mur up next. So I'm pretty sure that I know the answer to this one. And it comes from like a time when horses were maybe used as a form of payment in some instances. But if someone was going to give you a horse, you would check the teeth to see how healthy the animal was. And so, you know, someone's going to just gift you a horse why do you fucking care how healthy it is? It wasn't your horse in the first place kind of thing. It's a gift. So just be happy no matter how healthy the dang horse is. What uh, do you think, Sarah? Vet bills are expensive. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I'm looking a gift horse in the mouth, to be clear. <laughs> what do you think, Sarah? No, that, I never even thought about it like that. I was thinking more about when uh, I'm, I'm going to fail now because I can't remember who it was. You know, they sent the horse over and it was full of 
Oh, the Trojan horse? Oh, yeah. Trojan horse. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> but I think I may have that wrong now. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that'd be a good use for that too. Yeah, because if you look inside that mouth, oof. oof. Yeah. Don't look in there too closely. Mm -mm. Like but I think I may have that wrong. I, th I think uh, I think Mer probably has that one right. Not me. What do you think, Jeff? Uh, I was going to say what Mer was saying, because when you buy an animal, you know, not necessarily a horse, but you check its teeth. So it's, it would probably be rude if somebody's just giving you a horse to be like, well, if it's not healthy, I don't want it. You see what you got? Yeah, I believe that's the origin as well. I think I looked that one up once. <laughs> I was like, just right now? now? What? <laughs> <laughs> not right now. I'll keep my hands where you can see them. I guess that's like if someone gives you a bottle of wine and it's not really a good bottle of wine, you just say thanks anyway, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Don't and you drink it. Your... In mouth. You drink it some night as your fourth bottle of wine, and then it doesn't matter. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> then it it great. Great. All right. So myrrh is the closest on this one. This phrase alludes to the fact that the age, uh, hence the usefulness of a horse can be determined by looking at its teeth. The expression says that if a horse is given as a gift, you should not look at its teeth to determine its quality. So this can be traced back uh, in print in 1546. And the phrase can be traced back even further to the Latin text of St. Jerome in the letter to the Ephesians in 400 AD. So this has been used for quite a while. What about raining cats and dogs? Means it's raining too heavy, torrential rain. We got Sara going first. <laughs> Look at that face. I thought this was a song and I thought it was raining men. <laughs> it's rain. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, that's an episode of Sex in the City. <laughs> uh, so I think this came from uh, when people got really sick and tired of their cats and dogs and they just threw them out the window. Oh, oh, <laughs> gosh, that's harsh. Yeah. Too soon. So I have no dark. idea. Jess, what do you got? <laughs> I was actually, I have no idea, but I'm thinking maybe something along the lines of like. It's raining so heavy that like the cats and dogs want to come inside. Like when times when people would pretty much keep their animals outside. So it's raining so heavy that even the cats and dogs come inside. I don't know. Interesting. Do see? Oh gosh, I'm next. Um, okay, since I don't know, I'll make a guess. I'm trying to decide between two guesses. I'm going to guess that it has to do with uh, tornadoes and the kind of rain that comes with tornadoes is really heavy and maybe it pulls up animals and drops them back down. What about Murr too? <laughs> um, I think that it has to do with <laughs> ships coming into port and being too heavy. So they throw off all the cats on board to make the ship lighter. <laughs> <laughs> my other guess was when cats would like hang out on rooftops or whatever and it, when, when, it, when it rained hard the rain would like flood the cats off of the rooftop little awnings with the, like I, with the tornado theory it would, you just it went you can't go again T -T. i went twice i went twice i feel <laughs> like i've heard the origin of this one before and i can't for the life of me remember it it would sound so much better if it was raining horses and elephants or something cats that's and true. dogs that's not a really big tornado i'm gonna put a trigger warning on this one too right <laughs> i hope no, i hope none of our listeners are overly sensitive <laughs> we're <laughs> just kidding <laughs> at all sensitive was it uh like so, siren soapbox does not actually condone throwing cats and dogs out the window or i mean they haven't met my elephants cat, so. or horses or off know. of a ship <laughs> All right, so I was kind of I was t torn between Jess and TC on mm. this one as far as the winner. Well, what's the origin? We'll help you decide. Uh, and then TC talked again. <laughs> I told you I had I had two guesses. 
Well, you didn't say it during your turn. So the origin is reigning cats and dogs is a particular expression from the 17th century with uncertain origins. However, there is a theory. It is the thatched roof theory. Thatch is a type of padding or covering made of woven and bound straw, reeds, palm, or similar plant, plant material. Long ago, when most homes had thatched roofs, cats and dogs would hide inside the thatch during storms. During a heavy rain, the animals would be washed out of the thatch and the falling would be considered raining as a joke that became a popular phrase. I feel like TC needs a winner, win winner, one. chicken dinner. <laughs> was closer, yeah. She was talking right. about being washed off the roof, which is hilarious. That's yeah. awesome. All right. TC is the winner on that round. Next one, we've got under the weather to be mm. ill. Feel drunk or intoxicated, having a hangover, feeling sick. Jess, what do you think? Maybe it has something to do with like you were out in a storm too long and it made you made you sick. So you were under the influence of the weather. That's what I'm going with. You see? Yeah, I was going to say that, you know, everyone used to think that if you were out in the rain or whatever, you would catch cold. So I'm going to go with the fact that if you were out in the weather, you're going to be sick. Mer? I am going to say that this came from sailors who would fall ill on a, during a heavy rainstorm, maybe because they were seasick or something. So again, it's a good under, guess. under the weather. Dara? I've been thinking more that there was the, the old wives tale about if you went out in the cold, you would catch a cold. Mm -hmm. All right. So Murr is going to win this one because she mentioned sailors. The origin of this phrase can be traced back to maritime sources. Yes. In old days, when a sailor was not feeling good, he would be sent below deck to recover so he could be away from the weather. So not sick because of the weather, but you're hiding gotcha. from the weather to recover. So that's mm. why you got closest on that one. The mm. last straw. The last in the sequence of an unpleasant things. The last tolerable thing in which something cannot be accepted. We've got TC going first. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. I'm going to guess that this has to do with... Um when you ran out of straw and so bad things were happening because you no longer had straw to feed your animals it was the last straw Mer, i i second that i do believe that it has something to do with like bales of straw um and feeding animals um yeah i don't know i don't got anything else sorry and this unpleasantness <laughs> Yeah, I, I, man, I, I got nothing. I mean, I was thinking when you pick straws and you pick, get their short straw, but that's got nothing. That's not an idiom. That's, that's just the short straw. I know. It's not the last straw at all, unless the last straw was the short straw. Oh, isn't that the icing on the cake? <laughs> <laughs> Another idiom. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, Jess. I have no idea if this is right, but I just kind of want to, it made me think of the straw that broke the camel's back and it has to do with like, that was the last straw that you put on there and that's what did it in. Like that's what hurt the camel, poor camel. So I was so good guess. Yes, it's right. Breaking camel's back. Nice the last job, straw. Jess is a short Ooh. version of the phrase, the last straw that broke the camel's back. The phrase has been used since the mid 1700s. The phrase has many variations over the years. There's an earlier version back in the 1800s that states the last feather breaks the horse's back. The first time this phrase was used was in May of 1816. Yet straw upon straw was laid until the last straw broke the camel's back. Good job, Our Jess. Oh, I know. That's kind of mean. <laughs> Next up, we got oh, sleep tight. 
It's an affectionate way of wishing someone a good night's sleep to sleep well. First up, we've got Mer. So um, when I was little, it wasn't just sleep tight. It was sleep tight. Don't let the bed bugs bite, (laughs) which I think is the whole phrase. And um, I think that that came from a time when people were literally infested with bed bugs and they would tell people, you know, affectionately sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite, knowing that they were just going to be biting. They lived Sarah? in bed bugs. Um, now I'm itchy. I guess uh, keeping, I, I don't know, keeping yourself all bundled up. I don't know where it would come from. I guess making sure, I, I guess from way back when you didn't, wouldn't want to let air, anything get in. You wanted to, to keep all bundled up. I don't know. Hell, I don't know. It's a cute dog. <laughs> it is a cute dog. He's pretty. That's what you get. I was thinking along the lines of, you know, like bed bugs and rodents and whatever, like the times when you would wear like a, a night cap that was tight on your head and you had like the drawstrings on your sleeves of your pajamas and your the pants on your pajamas so that like bed bugs couldn't get in. So sleep tight, like keep your keep your stuff all tightened tight. up. Yeah. Button up. What about TC. I've n- I know that saying too, so I'm just going to go with something completely different because if we all say the same thing, the first person wins. So I'm going to go with something about swaddling a baby, swaddling them up nice and tight because that's how they sleep well. I'm going to have Murr as the closest guess, even though that is the second part of the known origin. So it is often said that the phrase dates back to the time when people slept on beds made of rope. If the ropes were pulled tight, then it would be more comfortable to sleep on. When your house guest has overstayed their welcome, the ropes would be loosened in the hopes that they would vacate your home. (laughs) In the actual fact, the phrase was first used in 1866 by Susan Bradford Epps in her diary through some eventful years. By this time, some box springs were already replace, replacing the uh, rope beds. So mm-hmm. this phrase is often used along with don't let the bug- bed bugs bite. Some people believe that it was to tuck in people tight into the sheets to attempt to keep the bed bugs out. This is not very plausible, but it rhymes nicely. So we will have Murr as the winner for that one. Next one is easy as pie. Easy. Child's play. Sarah, what do you got? Uh, um, maybe dating back to when um, this was the easiest thing for housewives to make way back when. It was very easy for this to be made. The easiest thing to cook and bake because baking sucks and baking cakes is difficult, but pies are easy. Okay. Jeff, what do you got? Maybe something to do with, uh, like it's the easiest way to use up your extra food. Like you could put extra vegetables and meat into like a, a pot pie and you can put extra fruit into a sweet pie. I don't know. Sounds like a good magazine article, Mer. (laughs) I don't cook, so I have no idea how easy pie actually is. (laughs) (laughs) TC, you got a guess? I'm going to guess that it comes from the fact that you can put anything in a pie. So regardless of what's in your pantry, you can make shepherd's pie or fruit pie or whatever pie you want to make. You can put anything in it. It's easy as pie. Mer, what do you got? I think it relates to pie eating contests. People could, they thought that maybe they could easily eat all the pie. (laughs) My favorite guess of this whole game so far. (laughs) (laughs) But I think I'm going to have to give Sarah the points on this one because this one dates back (laughs) 
And she gets a point just for the face she made. <laughs> <laughs> it dates back to the time of Mark Twain. Pie is not easy to make, so the comparison cannot relate to making a pie. It is in the fact that of having or eating a pie. Well, that kind of goes to Murr's point, too. The phrase comes to exist in the 1900s in the United States of America. A pie was used to represent something that was pleasant and exchanged at joyous occasions. In 1855, the phrase in a slight variation was published in the book called Which, Right or Left, where it was used as nice as pie. Prior to this, Mark Twain used the phrase polite as pie. Although we all know who was making the pies back in the day. It's probably the women. So sorry. Probably. Sorry, you won that point. Next think, up, we- I think Murr's closer on that one. You really I think I kind of do too. It has to do with how easy it is to eat a pie, not to make a pie. Well, that was a pie eating contest. But it is easy to eat pie, and I said those words. You did. She did. I don't know. I'll let you four decide. Uh, I don't think it's me. I think it's me. <laughs> Jess, Jess is not voting. <laughs> I abstain. I know. I know, right? So I'm just going to nope octopus right out of this one. <laughs> All right. Well, then how about we take it with a grain of salt? To understand oh. that something is not completely true or right. To not take something too seriously. To accept, but with some reservations or skepticism. Jess, what do you think? I'm going to guess it has something to do with how salt is supposed to like enhance the flavor of things. So like it makes it easier to take if you take it with some salt, like it makes food taste better. So like maybe if something's like bitter and hard to, hard to take, if you add some salt, it makes it better. Interesting. Tasty, like what do you think? Full of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going to say that it has to do with the fact that you could preserve food with salt. And so if there was really old food, but it had a grain of salt, you could take it. You didn't have to take it too seriously. Food preservation. All right, Mer. I think um, it has to do with volume. So, you know, grains, individual grains of salt are, you know, whatever is one little grain of salt, but together there are so many grains of salt. So you just have to, um, you can't, I don't know, it kind of like dilutes the, it dilutes the theory or it dilutes the, whatever it is you're talking about, because there are so many grains of salt. How do you know which or what to believe? I don't know. That's, that's where I'm going with that. I never really did know this one. I never really understood it. We got Sarah. I think it has more to do with measurement than food flavoring or anything like that. Or, but I'm not. I don't know how or why. But I think it's more something to do with measurement. I I really this, like the measurement this, in Murr's explanation. This guess doesn't count, but I was going to say measurement too because grains of salt are not precise; they are different. Each grain I, of salt is a little bit different really like all those explanations so much more than the actual thing and Jess actually gets it because she said easier to take and she also said spoonful of sugar makes the medicine easier to go down this great expression although an ancient one was not used in its current meaning until much later it is said that Philony the elder well, there we got this guy again Linnaeus. translated yes <laughs> translated an ancient antidote for poison in 77 ad which recommends taking the antidote with a grain of salt in its current meaning however it has been used since the 1600s and a pinch of salt variation came much later around the mid 1900s so it's to to make an antidote for poison easier to take so <laughs> jess gets the point on that one yeah she sure Yay. does but your guys' explanation makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah, I like mine and Sarah's and, uh, and I like it a, a lot better. A lot better. Yeah. yeah. All right. Last one, ladies. Let the chips fall where they may. 
just to let something happen, no matter what the consequences are. Do something without worry. We got TC going first. Uh, I'm going to guess that this has to do with betting in a game of cards. That when you're not sure what to do, you just put it all out there and you let whatever happens, happens. The chips fall to whomever. That's what I'm going to guess. So I like your betting idea, but I'm going to double down and say that it's actually betting at a roulette table, not on card games. Let the chips fall where they lie, because in roulette, you are literally betting with chips. Sarah, what you get? It probably goes back even further. Maybe it's like when they used to play with jacks on the ground, you know, when they would maybe something like that. Jess? Jess? I'm going with betting as well, but a, um, I think it's the craps table where you actually put the chip on your bet. Um, like you, you put it on like you think it's going to be six or whatever and so you have to, if you're just letting them fall where they may, you just toss your chips out and land on whatever bet it is. And also, I, I want some potato chips now. Maybe it's it has so to do with maybe it has to do with horse poop. I I have the the potato chips. That's where you guys off. And TC went first and guessed gaming, of course. And I wonder how this would have gone differently. That was she, in my brain before she spoke. Was bad. yeah. Had she not gone first, because I don't think I can win anybody on this round. All the first guesser wins. It is. Yeah, that's how we decide that first yeah. guesser wins. Hold on. Let's see. This phrase, origin, it was, a, ugh, wow. I can talk. It started in America in the late 1800s and has a reference to chopping wood. It implies that a hmm. woodcutter should focus on cutting the logs. <laughs> so literally no one wins. Right. And not worry about where the small pieces, chips fall. Although TC, you kind of said something about not worrying about where things fall. Okay. What did you say again, Sarah? Uh, like jacks. Like, you know, being, oh, like yeah, jacks. you were way off. Uh, <laughs> 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 you didn't say anything about lumber. All right. I'm going to add up the points real quick. Did you give that to TC? No, nobody. I gave that, that to no one. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. So while we do that, here are some phrases well, it going out of style. Feel oh. free to discuss. Oh, yeah. They're, they're all from our, our era. <laughs> Be kind, rewind. Oh, oh my gosh. I My kids have probably no color. idea what that means. Um, broken record though. So records are finals making a comeback. My six, she's 17. Now my 17 year old wanted a record player for Christmas. This, not this past Christmas, but the one before. So I think she would get the broken record. I think most people would now. I think they're definitely back. I don't know what hanging Chad means. Oh my God. Oh my God. From the, what? was it the 2000 election? The Even Bush I election. know that one. I mean, I don't know what this saying is. Miami-Dade County. That's, I mean, it wasn't that Miami-Dade County? Wasn't that where it was? I think I don't you're know. right. It was definitely uh, Florida. What does it yeah. mean as a saying? Like, how would you use that? I know what the origin is, but how, what's that how, saying? Maybe it's like, uh, maybe if it's being, if you're being wishy-washy or That's something. Equivocal. Yeah, equivocal. Like, Quit being a hanging Chad. Quit being a hanging Chad. Make up your motherfucking mind. Yeah. <laughs> what about um, play it by ear? That saying. Yeah, that didn't come up. Um, but that one always is weird to me. I don't so really... we, we looked that up and it means that when you're a really good musician, you don't have to look at the sheet music. You can play uh -huh. it by ear. So Dino and I now say no sheet music. When we want to go do something and not make any plans whatsoever, we just say no sheet music. <laughs> That's like a good one. You just consult your adventure date book. Right. Ooh. Except that would be literally sheet music. <laughs> oh. Very oh, composed. So it's the opposite of that, Jess. It's, <laughs> the opposite of that. it's exactly not that. <laughs> so Jess, did you figure out what a hanging chat is yet? No. 
Everyone you, just scoffed do, at me for not knowing what it means. <laughs> so during voting, like 2000 was, or whatever. I think it was 2000. It was the, what, it was a Bush election. When we were still doing paper votes. I need to like punch yeah. the little, the perforated squares out. Okay. Well, the little pieces of squares that stayed attached to the ballot, they called them hanging chads. And there because, was. Uh, because they went, they went back into place. If you stack all the papers, sometimes the hanging chad went back into place and you couldn't tell who was voted for. So yeah. some of the votes didn't count because of the hanging chad. And there was like a huge like recount on all the votes in Florida because all the hanging chads. It took was forever that? for them to call that election because of the recount. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. All right. You guys ready to hear the winners? Oh, I know who the winner is. Yeah, me too. I've been keeping score. Me too. <laughs> Can, can you at least pretend I'm at the helm of this episode? <laughs> seven. I know, exactly. <laughs> All the sevens know who won right now. So with one point, we have Sarah. Mm-hmm. Two points, we have Jess. Three Ooh. points, we have TC. And with five points and uh, having to come up with the challenge anyway, we have Mer. Yes, <laughs> I love this. Uh, oh, it's great. Well, I mean, this was fun. So obviously the challenge this week is going to be for our listeners to tell us their favorite idioms. Yes. Ooh, yeah. And like um, their favorite ways to use them. I love TC's new favorite idiom, no sheet music. I hope that takes up. I hope that picks up. Picks up speed. Is that an idiom? I think it is. I think it is. It is now. <laughs> I it mean, is now. 25,000. So look it up. <laughs> Plenty to choose from. And we're making more each day. Like no sheet music. Well, this was a ton of fun. We should do more mystery episodes because I love them. <laughs> so thank you so much, Sirens, for uh, joining us tonight. It was a, again, a ton of fun. Elsie, thank you so much for putting this together. I know it's a lot of work to put together a mystery episode and I don't want you to think we don't appreciate it. It was amazingly fun. Thank you. And thank you fellow explorers for listening to this episode. Go ahead and click like, and subscribe wherever you're listening right now, then head over to our website, sirensoapbox.com, where you'll be able to take a deeper dive into the world of Siren Soapbox. Send us a challenge or just send us a message to let us know you're listening. We love hearing from our listeners, so we hope you'll reach out. And until next time, dive in, stay curious, and be happy. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Siren Soapbox. And a special thank you to C-Strings for providing our music. Snag your latest CP from iTunes today. Follow the Sirens on all the social medias and don't forget to tell your friends about us. Like and subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. We'll catch you next time on another episode of Siren Soapbox.